All right. Today is Thursday, September 16th. And this is a recap for the stock market activities today. The market took a roller coaster ride, starting with a flush down and then a midday pump that took the market to park back at the flat line. The likelihood is the roller coaster will continue tomorrow because as we discussed yesterday, the seasonality and the mechanics are taking front seat. Market makers are practicing the maximum pain theory ahead of quad witching tomorrow to make the majority of calls and puts open expire worthless thus the dump in the morning to shake out call holders then trap and shake out put holders as the market recovers back to the flat line when it comes to the economy today we got data from retail sales which came out beating expectations by far as most market watchers were assuming a bad reading after the disastrous miss from retail sales over China. But in reading the details of the report, one cannot help but to see the pattern of hoarding by consumers, as if they're expecting an upcoming disaster. On one hand, perhaps consumers are hoarding as a result of inflation expectations. As we continue to see the inflation crisis deepens, with shipping containers rates reaching all time highs and we continue to get warning calls regarding the upcoming holiday season and the shortages we will face in that particular season on the other hand we have a pandemic that doesn't seem to end cases are rising rapidly in this country and even in highly vaccinated countries like israel cases have reached all time highs prompting calls for a third perhaps fourth and fifth booster shots and all of this is happening amid draconian mandates of get the shot or get fired, making employers who are already struggling with labor shortages face a difficult decision, while consumers and employees alike face an uncertain journey and pandemic fatigue. While our leaders, specifically from the White House and the Fed, continue to experiment with reckless policies, leading the economy to face two dire choices between stagflation or straight-out depression, as the Fed struggles to control inflation but also refuses to tighten the monetary policy. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a crisis of leadership, and if it goes on for longer, it will take us to a future full of darkness and uncertainty. And this is the message of the day. Of course, we will talk about all of these issues, including the retail sales data, the Empire and Philly Fed manufacturing indices, and many other macro data, including calls from the likes of Ray Dalio, for example, warning about the cryptocurrency market. And we will do that in the headlines of the day video, which I intend to release tomorrow. But for now, we're moving on to the market's performance today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the red down 63.07 points or a decline of 0.18%. The Nasdaq closing in the green by 20.39 points or a gain of 0.13%. The S&P 500 closing in the red down 6.95 points or a decline of 0.16%. What about the sector's performance today? Leading the pack at number one but not capturing any metal because the performance across the board was pathetic consumer cyclicals and then we have technology closing in the green barely but we have a lot of pain in the so-called inflation trade of materials energy industrials why because the u.s dollar shot up higher and we will talk about the u.s dollar in the charts analysis what about the advance to decline ratios the nyse 39 percent advancing versus 59 percent declining the nasdaq 49 percent advancing versus 47 percent declining what about futures pain across the board why the rise of the united states dollar popping higher after the release of retail sales data perhaps the data will prompt tapering sooner on top of that we have a lot of weakness in asian and european markets but specifically asian we talk about china and therefore the rush to the safety of the u.s dollar and therefore today we're not seeing the positive activities that we've been seeing along the week for energy futures crude oil futures pretty much closed at the flat line but we have losses here a pullback for natural gas Finally, now I believe that the run in natural gas is not over yet. This is just a mere pullback and then we will see natural gas popping higher once again. And notice the pattern, by the way. In the beginning of the year, traders were chasing lumber prices higher and then they shifted to coffee and certain grains and now they're shifting to natural gas. And what's next? Is it going to be cotton? Is it going to be live cattle? 
perhaps lean hogs? Because money has to chase something. The Fed continues to print over $120 billion every month. This tsunami of liquidity, not just from the Fed, but central banks across the world, have to chase something. The equities markets already at all-time highs, bloated valuations across the board. So money is chasing commodities. Ask yourself a question. Are crude oil prices rising higher due to legitimate demand when we have Delta shutdowns across half of the globe? Of course not. So why are crude oil prices rising higher? Well, the supply is not here to begin with, but most importantly, we have money chasing the move higher. We have a tsunami of liquidity that has to chase something. And most recently, it has been chasing natural gas. Yes. And my belief is it will not stop chasing commodities until the cocaine operation out of the Fed stops. What about softs? Muted activities for sugar, lumber, and coffee futures. Meanwhile, modest losses led by OJ, cotton, and cocoa futures. What about metals? A lot of pain here. A massive beat down. Gold down, silver down, platinum down, copper down big today. But as you know, I love copper and I remain bullish on copper. But on days when the dollar pops, you will see pain in copper and the majority of metals. This is the name of the game and therefore if you are invested in copper, metals, materials in general like I do, you have to hedge properly. And you can do that via put options. You can read the chart of the US dollar and upcoming catalysts. And if the charts say the dollar is about to pop, you buy puts on these names that you own or you hedge by other means. The only shining light in metals futures is palladium. Palladium been getting hit over and over and over again. Or perhaps it has bottomed at this point. What about meats? Modest moves for live and feed or cattle futures, meanwhile a massive pop for lean hogs futures, aka the new big tech. Why are lean hogs futures rising higher today? Well, we have another disease, Ta -da. prompting shortages and culling of pork in many nations. And now we have imports from the United States rising higher, and therefore lean hogs futures popping higher, and they will continue to pop higher, in my opinion. What about grains? Mixed picture here with pain in soybean oil, a down day of more than 2.5%. We also have losses for rough rice and corn futures. Meanwhile, we have soybeans, wheat, and canola futures closing at the flat line. On the other hand, today was a good day for both soybean meal and oats futures. Massive gain for the big O, oats. Moving on to the options market, what's going on here in the big casino? Leading the pack at number one, the hottest table per usual is Apple with about 1 million contracts, about 64% of those were calls. And at number two, here we go, Palantir, PLTR. Rising higher, an awesome week for PLTR with about 1 million contracts trading today. About 78% of those were calls. Now, we talked about this name in the beginning of the week, matter of fact, over the weekend, and I pointed out the depressed IV rank, the implied volatility, but perhaps the IV percentage, which was a sign for a bottom in implied volatility in Palantir. It didn't tell you which way the stock will move, up or down, but it told you that this is the time to buy options for Palantir. And those who did buy calls, by the way, those options appreciated by over a thousand percent. This is the magic of implied volatility. All you need is just a little move in IV and you're gonna score big. But here we go at number three, Tesla, the souffle with about 840,000 contracts, about 47% of those were calls. Now, since we have quad witching tomorrow, let's go over maximum pain once again. Here is the options grid for the SPY. The highest open interest remains at 450. Now, put yourself in the shoes of market makers. You sold those calls. What is your obligation if the SPY closes above 450 by tomorrow? Your obligation is you got to buy shares of the SPY at market price and deliver them to the buyer at 450. Meaning if the SPY closes at 453, you got to have to buy the SPY at 453 and deliver those shares at the price of 450 to the buyer. Meaning you're losing 
three bucks. So what do you do as a market maker? Well, obviously you want to close the market below 450 to make the majority of these calls, the open interest, expire worthless but there is a catch because when we shift to puts the highest open interest is also at the 450 now what is your obligation as a market maker when you sell puts your obligation is you gotta buy the underlying stock at the strike price meaning if these puts expire in the money and so far they are say the SPY closes flat tomorrow at 448 yes those calls will expire worthless no obligation at all but you still have the obligation of delivering on those 450 puts that expired in the money and your obligation of them as a market maker is to buy shares of the SPY at 450 now buying at 450 while the market closes at 448 you're losing two bucks now now if it closes at 445 you're losing five bucks etc etc but where is the maximum pain in the SPY we have about 58,000 contracts open for the puts the 450 puts on the other hand we have almost 200,000 open interest in the 450 calls so what makes sense is the market maker has to do another roller coaster ride pumping dumping or dumping pumping anyway it doesn't matter but it would make sense if you dump first to make sure that all of these 450 call holders are shaken out of the market closing at losses before the expiration and then you pump the market higher to make the puts expire worthless and the ideal scenario is perhaps closing the market at 449 that will make sure that all of these calls expire worthless at the same time your losses from the puts are reduced to only one dollar and you only have about 50,000 contracts to deal with that's not a massive number anyways what about Apple what's going on here we have the 150 this is the maximum pain point we have 169,000 contracts open right now let's say 170,000 contracts your obligation as a market maker if Apple closes above 150 is to buy Apple at the market price and deliver those shares at the price of 150 meaning you lose money what does that mean you want to close apple below 150 but there is a catch once again the puts the highest open interest at the 150 and then the next one at 145 you certainly don't want to push the market down below 145 in this case apple but again about 80,000 contracts for the puts open versus 169,000. the maximum pain says do the roller coaster once again and close apple at around 150 exactly therefore you buy the shares from the puts that you saw and you deliver them at the same price to call buyers what about Tesla what's going on here the highest open interest all over the place it used to be 750 but look at what happened here they closed those 750 calls a lot of them booking profits what does that mean it means that perhaps the stock will weaken tomorrow but pay attention here we have about 23,000 open interest contracts at the 750 calls what about the puts what's going on with the puts here the 750 has about 13 and a half but the highest open interest at 740 so once again this is split 50 50 you obviously want to close tesla at around 745 but if you do you're gonna have to deliver all of these open interest contracts below 745 not a lot of them so it's not a big deal either way so in my opinion the power in determining where tesla is gonna close is not on the hands of market makers they could care less because these are not major contracts and they're all over the place they're spread all over the options grid the power here is on the hands of options holders and we have already seen that the 750 calls holders are already closing today in my opinion this will lead to a weakness in tesla tomorrow perhaps closing below 750 we'll see now you have to remember this the market maker will try to close the market at the maximum pain point shaking out the majority of calls and puts open making them expire worthless they will try but there are no guarantees here the market could do whatever it wants depending on the buy and sell force dynamics if for example market participants decide that September 17th and beyond all the way to the end of October perhaps the worst period 
in the stock market and therefore we're going to sell everything tomorrow it doesn't matter if the market maker wants to park the stock at a certain price the forces of selling will speak the loudest moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today starting with the ticker kweb the kweb the chinese technology etf lots of pain here in the chinese names you know the story but perhaps we might see a pump tomorrow a rebound a dead cat bounce short cover etc but here we have somebody betting for more pain to come not in in the immediate term but perhaps all the way till october 15th this is the expiration date for this trade and they bought the 43 puts with expectations that the k-web will drop by more than 11 percent by then and they paid about 70 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about one million dollars what about the ticker opad this is for offer pad the name is up over a hundred percent since the bottom it's a short squeeze it's a gamma squeeze it's a stupidity squeeze it's whatever squeeze somebody spit the ticker on tiktok or whatever and the stock shot up higher a massive move the company for all i know doesn't even have revenue but who cares about revenue revenue is for losers but perhaps the pump is over here because somebody's betting for pain to come calling a top by buying the 15 bucks puts for the expiration date of you guessed it tomorrow with expectations that OPAD will drop by more than 25%. Now, the name is down over 10% after hours, so it is still possible that the stock will drop by more than 25% by tomorrow. And they paid about 40 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about half a million dollars. What about the trade for the ticker SPY for the S&P 500? They're buying puts here, betting for pain to come, specifically the 415 puts with the expiration date of October 29th with the expectations that the SPY will drop by more than 7% by then and they paid about 3 bucks and 20 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about three million dollars what about the trade for the ticker fivn this is for five nine they're betting for a massive drop here by buying the 140 puts with the expiration date of november 19th with the expectations that the name will drop by more than 17 percent they paid about three bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about two and a half million dollars what about the trade for the ticker pacb this is for a company called pacific biosciences you can read this trade as selling a covered call and then buying some puts or perhaps a strangle buying both calls and puts straddle excuse me because they're betting for a move of about five percent or so either way by opening the 26 puts and the 29 calls the expiration date of October 15th. They paid about one buck and 20 cents a piece for the 26 puts, and they paid about one buck and 40 cents for the 29 calls. And if you read it this way, the trader spent about $1.7 million for the trade. What about the ticker QQQ, the NASDAQ? They're buying puts here, betting for more pain to come in the NASDAQ by buying the 357 and a half puts with the expiration date. October 29th with the expectations that the Nasdaq will drop by over five and a half percent by then they paid about three bucks and 90 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about two and a half million dollars what about the trade for the ticker SPIR this is for Spire Global this is a space satellite kind of company and yesterday we had the launch of SpaceX the successful launch of SpaceX. And this is, of course, prompting traders to bet on these space-related names. This is one of them. And they're betting for gains to come by buying the 12 and a half calls with the expiration date of October 15th, with expectations that the name will rise higher by more than 9.5% by then. They paid about one buck and a half a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars lastly what about the trade for the ticker d e double l dell for you guessed it dell they're buying puts here specifically the 95 puts with the expiration date of october 15th they're betting for a downside of more than six percent by then for dell and they paid about one buck a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about five hundred thousand dollars also known as half a million dollars moving on to the heat map analysis what's going on here obviously the market is flat to negative overall led by materials a lot of pain in materials my favorite 
and the reason is the dollar popped higher. Pain in gold, copper, steel, everything is down. The dollar popped higher. At the height of the day, it was a pop for about a half a percentage point, which is a lot for materials to handle on one day. But these pops and drops will be transitory, meaning the algos will react materials based on the pop in the dollar. But as the dollar stabilizes, even though it's trading at elevated levels from, say, yesterday, you will see materials bouncing back once again because there are many catalysts here for these names to rise higher. When the dollar rises higher, we also see pain in energy and industrials. So all of these inflationary sectors of the market are trading down. And while we saw a pop, a mini one, a small one, in the 10-year yield, banks did not celebrate at all. They were flat throughout the day. Now, what's working today is certain names in the high multiple high momentum names that suffered a lot of losses in the beginning of the week and now perhaps we're seeing some short covering and profit taking we're talking about names like square crowd strike trade disc all of these names traded higher today but the only consistent positive theme today was the retail side meaning stocks that popped higher as a reaction of the number we got from retail sales for example look at apparel tj maxx lulu likewise in restaurants mcdonald's cmg chipotle even the big stores home depot lowe's walmart target dollar general all rising higher along with the reopening names with exception of casinos of course this is related to china but we look at airlines airlines are trading higher why because was there is perhaps this optimism that the consumer is stronger than what we thought. Remember, we got into this number with a horrific consumer sentiment reading. We got into this number with a horrific jobs report. And therefore, expectations were down. But the number beat expectations by a lot. And when you read the details, you see that a lot of spending took place in department stores of all places. Some other names that managed to outperform today, including Lucid Motors, the ticker LS, excuse me, LCID, formerly known as CCIV. And this is due to a call from Bank of America analysts who described the name as the Tesla of electric vehicles, which is confusing. What does that even mean? Tesla of the electric vehicles? That's a stupid comparison, but perhaps we have a lot of holders here, bag holders in Bank of America in this name, and they want a pump to pass the bag to the retail crowd. We also have Ford. Ford managed to outperform today, bucking the trend of uh, other auto manufacturers, and the reason is we got the reservation numbers for the new F-150 Lightning. This is the new electric truck by Ford. Meanwhile, when is the uh, cyber truck coming, by the way? Is it 2022, 2023, 2025, or is it to infinity and beyond? Just like the robo taxes, by the way. Moving on to charts, let's see what happened today. The answer is nothing, of course, closing at the flat line, but a lot of action intraday. This is the SPY 30 minutes chart. What happened? A flush down in the morning, and then ta-da, a V-shaped recovery closing exactly where we started and of course the reason behind the move the roller coaster move is once again flushing calls and put buyers the maximum pain theory but the moral of the story is the spy managed to close above 447 once again and here is just food for thought by the way and i'm not making a call here i'm just presenting you with an idea is this a reverse head on shoulder formation and if it is then perhaps the market has bottomed right now at least for the short term we'll see what about the spy a daily chart and this is where it gets a little concerning because you have the trend line and so far the spy is trading above the trend line but it appears as if it is struggling to pop out of the trend line higher notice the past three reaction by the way reactions by the way all of them were strong reactions strong bounces off the trend line this one is different this one is a little weaker it's not bouncing higher strongly with high volume with high conviction Conviction. What's going on here? Likewise, the momentum indicators this time around are a lot weaker than the previous three bounces. We're talking about the MACD and the RSI indicators. Breaking the trend line and breaking 4,384 and a half will bring out the end of this trend. Moving on to the Q's 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? I'm presenting the idea once again. Is this a reverse head and shoulder formation? And if it is, the market has already bottomed, at least for now. I doubt it because we have not closed above 378.45, which is the resistance level. We have quad witching. They're going to do these roller coaster rides, and perhaps in doing so, they have left a pattern 
a misleading pattern of a reverse head and shoulder. Are you paying attention or not, by the way? I'm saying perhaps the market makers, as they're shaking out calls and put options holders, they made this pattern, but the pattern is misleading. What about the daily chart for the continuous contract on the NASDAQ? Again, the momentum indicators are weakening and we have negative divergences in both, but the candlestick pattern remains intact as a bull flag pattern. Yet I am hesitant in giving the bull flag sticker because I believe that we will have more weakness in Apple and other big cap technology names as we head to the weakest season in the stock market after September 17th. Moving on to the IWM 30 minutes chart, this is the Russell 2000. Again, we're seeing the same pattern of perhaps a reverse head and shoulder formation, but the IWM struggled to close above 223. It doesn't mean it's over yet. It could give it another shot tomorrow and close above 223. It could happen. But notice what took place today. When we talk about the components of the Russell 2000, you have certain reopening names, likes of airlines, restaurants, etc. at performing. On the other hand, you have certain meme stocks which have this weird correlation. When the market sells off, we see meme stocks popping higher. But when the market recovers, these same meme stocks crash. And you will see that exactly in the chart of AMC when we get there. But AMC is a massive component of the Russell 2000, believe it or not. And if it goes down, it will take down the IWM with it. With exception, if other names in the IWM outperform, the reopening names, etc., etc. But here it is, perhaps the most important chart in the market right now, the Dixie, the U.S. dollar. We have the double bottom. We have many catalysts to push the dollar higher from the technicals to the weakness in overseas markets to the tapering prospects. All of these are leading the U.S. dollar higher, but the dollar failed to close above 93. It still has another day to go, and if it closes above 93, we're going to start shitting our pants a little bit because if the dollar closes above 93, then the likelihood is it's not going to stop. It's going to continue to go higher and higher and higher until tapering actually happens. Happens. In the meantime, we will see a lot of pain, specifically in commodities, but the stock market in general, because a higher dollar is not favorable to the majority of stocks. Perhaps certain stocks that happen to be importers, solely importers, the likes of Home Depot, for example. But even then, if the market goes down, the big names go down, Home Depot will not be the only one outperforming, because we have the ETFization of the market. If the big guys go down, they take everything down with them. What about gold? Wow. Out. I should say. What a massive drop here. A big one and violating the Fibonacci support level. Now, what does that mean? Remember, gold is the mature guy in the room. It waits and waits and waits, and it doesn't make impulsive moves unless it is certain about the movement of its two enemies, the dollar and the 10-year yield. We have a third enemy, a smaller one in BTC, but for now, gold is concentrating on the two main enemies, the dollar and and yields. Both of them popping higher today. And of course, gold took a flush down, a massive flush down. This is the biggest decline in gold in over six weeks. And once again, folks, gold is uninvestable right now. If you're holding physical gold, that's okay. But trading gold and holding gold in your portfolio will come with a lot of pain. Wait till tapering actually happens, or we have certainty about tapering not happening. And then gold will be tradable once again. Now, the likelihood is if the dollar pops higher, closing above 93, goodbye gold, gold will flush down all the way to the next Fibonacci level of about 1,685. And here it is, the chart of the 10-year yield. What's going on here? Popping higher, but still not moving out of range. It is still consolidating within that range for weeks and weeks and weeks. But the bottom line is, the 10-year yield have solidified 1.28% as support over and over and over again. This kind of behavior is an indicator that we have a solid bottom here, a solid flooring, which will prompt the chart to bounce higher, or shall we say pop higher. We just need a catalyst here. Remember, this chart is fighting the Fed. The Fed is buying the TLT. The Fed is buying bonds. So the Fed is artificially suppressing yields. This chart should be reading a minimum 
of 2% right now, absent of the Fed's manipulation of the market. Moving on to the TLT weekly chart, still trading above 149, but the battle continues, grinding back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Are we about to have a resolution tomorrow? I doubt it, but perhaps the resolution will happen next week as we get the Fed's meeting. Will traders do certain uh, impulsive move on Friday in anticipation of the upcoming week? We'll see. But for now, the assumption is we will close flat within the trading range that we've been on in both the TLT and yields. And here it is, perhaps the most accurate indicator so far, the VIX four hours chart every time we have a crossing in the MACD which results in a minimum of a double digits pop when that happens which coincides with losses on the SPY the S&P 500 yet when the pop is over in the VIX and we see the MACD creating red impressions on the histogram it is clear that the VIX has topped the SPY bottom and we see an upside day in the SPY therefore in the morning I was watching this chart the four hours chart of the VIX and look at the MACD indicator it was trading negative even though the SPY was trading down, flushing down. And therefore, I did not buy the flush down on the SPY. I had a hunch that they will do a 180 and reverse the market back up higher. And the reason is the VIX is not reading green on the MACD. Now, what will happen tomorrow? This is your leading indicator right here, right there. If we have another crossing, creating green impressions in the histogram, then perhaps we will see a lot of pain in the market. But if the MACD indicator on the VIX continues to drive down, then we will see a pop on the SPY. How low can the VIX go? It can go all the way down to close the gap at around 16 and a half. How high can it go? The answer for now is 20. 20 has been proven to be extremely difficult here. Now the VIX managed to close above 20 on a weekly candle last week and this was an important development. Can the VIX repeat the performance of last Friday closing the weekly candle above 20? If it does, then oh boy, we're about to see a lot of pain in the upcoming week. What about Apple, the big kahuna, 30 minutes chart? What's going on here? Perhaps one way you can read the chart is we have a bottom for now. What do we mean by for now? We mean Friday. Remember the maximum pain. They want to close Apple at around 150. It's going to be a roller coaster up and down, but they want to park Apple at around 150, give or take. But another way to read the chart is, because remember, we have a higher high here, and therefore the bottom theory. Yet another way to read the chart is perhaps this is a bear flag formation, and we have yet another down leg that perhaps will take us all the way down to 145. Now, I would consider 145 as a more reliable bottom than 147 that we got right now. Do I lean on scenario number one or scenario number two? For now, I lean on scenario number one, meaning Apple made a higher high and therefore it could pop higher tomorrow. As we see profit taking from short covering, etc, etc. And here it is, what about Tesla, the souffle one hour chart. We had a reliable pattern of higher highs and higher lows, and this was broken last week. The assumption was that the trend is over, and usually when the trend is over, either the chart starts trading down or consolidates within a range, building some energy, debating where to go next, and then we see another trend building up or a flush down. Tesla did not wait at all. It bounced higher right away. We talked about the options activities, the pump via options, it's a gamma squeeze, and the stock is riding higher. We have a steep trend. So far, we're trading below the trend, which is extremely steep, which means that the stock, the chart, will have a hard time keeping and maintaining that trend. We already talked about the options market activities, and a lot of traders are booking profits the 750 calls meaning that the gamma squeeze is coming to an end at least for now for this week my bet is we will see weakness in tesla in tomorrow's session but tesla's chart has another thing working for it in the longer horizon the weekly chart look at the macd indicator the momentum the negative momentum bottomed around last month and since then we have witnessed the rebirth of the positive momentum once again be it not as strong as before. What does that mean? Perhaps a slow grinding rally, more reasonable gains than the cartoonish gains that we have seen before in previous rallies. But at any time, the rebound from negative to positive momentum could end and the chart could curl down again. So we continue to watch the weekly chart of Tesla. What about BTC? What's going on here in the tulip market? 
flat, nothing is going on here. We have lackluster action in the tulip market and we're waiting and waiting and waiting for what Gary Ginsler wants to do. For now, the guy went to sleep for all you know, and he's doing nothing at all. But there are reports that we will have a surprise announcement by the SEC and Gary Ginsler regarding crypto regulations. The criticism for Ginsler was, why don't you just announce ahead of time and give us clear guidelines versus a surprise announcement that would move the crypto market up or down sharply. But it appears to me that Ginsler wants the spotlight. He knows that the SEC has been in a coma and has been under criticism for many market participants and market watchers. So will Ginsler do something crazy as a surprise announcement, a surprise attack against Bitcoin and cryptos prompting a crash? We will see, but for now the technicals remain in no man's land. We have a massive flush down, some dip buying, assuming that this dip is no different than previous dips. It will be bought and BTC will push higher. But I'm not seeing confirmation here. I'm not seeing a follow-up on the dip buying that we saw the last couple of days. Personally, I would not touch it until it goes down to 42,000, retest that support, and then bounces higher aggressively. Then I would be more comfortable in going long BTC. Now, what about AMC? A lot of action in this name today. We discussed two scenarios yesterday. Of course, the chart flushed down all the way, closing the gap in the yellow bubble, and then it bounced higher. And we were waiting and waiting and waiting for the reaction in AMC. Will it be a bull flag formation that takes AMC higher or will it be a reverse ABC pattern, which will take AMC down to 42 and a half, perhaps violating that support? It was really tricky today, perhaps a bull trap, because as the market was flushing down in the morning, AMC was trading higher, sharply higher. But as the market bottomed intraday, midday, and started to trade higher, AMC reversed course and started to sell off. It's a weird phenomenon. So are meme stocks, specifically AMC and GME, GameStop, now acting as a hedge against the market? It's extremely weird. I have never seen anything like this before in the market. Or a garbage stock of a bankrupt company becomes a hedge against market volatility. What's going on here? But well, once again, welcome to the jungle. Welcome to the upside down market, the POW market. Lastly, moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have the University of Michigan's Consumer Sentiment Index, and this will be preliminary reading, meaning uh, it doesn't mean anything really. It's not that important. It's not going to move the market one way or the other. The main story, the real market mover will be quad witching. And now, you know, you get a little taste of quad witching today. The roller coaster ride, they want to close the market pretty much at the flat line. Will they be successful or not? That depends on the severity of the buying and selling dynamics. Anyhow, folks, it will be an interesting day tomorrow. And per usual, I will be on Twitter tweeting like a bird. And you can follow me on Twitter for real time updates and commentary. Thank you for watching thank you for listening this is all i got for you for now but i will talk to you again tomorrow <laughs> if you found the information presented in this video helpful please subscribe press the like button the notification button and follow me on social media